for those of you who might be looking for uh, asset classes outside of residential, um, office, downtown Toronto is uh, on an absolute tear and it looks likely to be that way uh, for a while. Probably most of us are not going to be buying or developing office towers downtown, um, but there are interesting ways to invest in, in some of these properties such as REITs. Uh, so it's almost like a stock market uh, or shares for real estate investment companies. There are a lot of office specific ones uh, out there. Um, uh, one thing that's interesting, considering my background is commercial real estate to start with, um, when all these towers that you saw going up downtown in the last seven, eight years, office towers, uh, and look closely, you can usually tell if it's an office tower or a condo tower. Um, there are a lot of them that have gone up. And what's interesting, they've added millions and millions of square feet of, of leasable office space to the market. What's really interesting is most of that is pre-leased. Pre-leased. All that space, the towers that are going up that are not finished, the space is spoken for for the most part. And you, this is not a secret, you can find it online. But that's unbelievable. So that, that really uh, tells you about the demand that there is and the economic engine that's, that's turning in Toronto. Well, it kind of works like the residential condo market. They, don't, they usually won't allow builders to build until they have at least 75% sales with banking yeah. financing. And probably works in the same manner with, with office space. Like in, some, in some buildings that's the case, but I've seen buildings that go up without that. Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, so office space and then industrial, it's actually one of my, my pet favorites. Um, uh, again, maybe not in the, in the cards to buy large warehouses, uh, but I just w did want to mention that industrial really has been doing quite well for the last few years. I expect that to continue uh, to be the case and for, if anything, for that to increase. Um, part of it has to do, it's not, again, blanket statements. It's not all e-commerce. Um, there's still some small manufacturing. Um, some small assembly that, that gets done. Warehousing is, is very much necessary. Um, but e-commerce does have some uh, uh, impact on the industrial space market. Um, anyway, just something to keep in mind. One thing that I don't think is disappearing, but there's definitely been a shift that started and will continue for the next 10 years is the retail space. Um, you're seeing a lot of retail spaces that used to be evidently used just for stores, you know, selling goods. A lot of them are being converted to um, uh, co-working spaces or uh, offices for dentists, lawyers, accountants, architects, etc. So a lot of street fronts are being transformed and no longer kind of walk-in traffic. They're becoming more destinations. And the biggest tip that I have for you if you're involved in that in any way is if, if you're a destination, so a service provider where people have to come to, as opposed to they're just walking down the street, oh, I want a can of Coke and I'm gonna walk into the convenience store, is um, you have to be accessible. So it has to, it's either you know your clientele is gonna be coming with public transit or you have parking uh, available. Because service providers on major arteries usually do not have parking or enough of it available. Yeah. Um, I know in, in my industry, as, as a too, we've, we've had situations where we have major national companies in the US have migrated to the Canadian market because of the exchange rate and things of yeah. that sort. So that's also been driving the population of people buying more industrial spaces or office spaces because for that for that purpose as well. So I, I just thought that would throw it in with your presentation. Absolutely agree. Well, then you have uh, a lot of American companies like GM recently closed down in Oshawa. It's, it's a big factory for uh, defense, right? Yeah. So, yes. So to your point on um, uh, service providers. So, if you're like doing like a walk-in medical tent, for example, or a dentist, or something, between like being, let's say, like, like subway stop mm -hmm. or having parking, what, what would you say would you base it on? Let's say, let's say it's, a, it's an urban center like downtown. Sure. So they Yeah. What would you, if you're gonna, let's say, buy like a major office concept, would you base your criteria on accessibility or? I'm going to try to answer that a little differently. A couple of years ago, I had a client, a physiotherapist, who was opening space downtown. And what she would do is she, her, her main clientele, she had built up over the years. They were going to come in from the suburbs to see her if they really wanted to see her. So she needs some accessibility and, and parking. But her main clientele, she was planning on servicing all of the office towers. And so she would actually go to office towers and ask who their preferred physiotherapy uh, service provider was. And that's how she kind of zeroed in on, there was one space that she really liked, I remember, um, but there were so many physiotherapists peppered out throughout some of the buildings, that she said there's too much competition. So we went to another area. 
Um, I don't know if I, would, if I could say accessibility versus parking. Um, there, some people believe that park, uh, driving is, is dramatically on the decline, that the government's going to, the municipal government's trying to get us to stop driving completely. I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. Um, I think people's habits are changing, um, especially with new offerings like you know Uber and Lyft. I, I think a lot of people, like in my business, it's very, very, very difficult to go to five different houses to show them using Uber. It's very, very difficult. Um, it's difficult for pizza delivery um, to, to park out front if there's not a parking spot out back to, to load up or to wait between calls. So I think, I think there are still times where, where parking is going to be necessary. Um, something for you to keep in mind. So a little bit like office space, you know, if we're talking about senior residences and things like that, I mean, those are big, big, big ticket items that, that we're probably not all buying in this room. But at the same time, you can either invest in senior living through uh, funds and REITs that specialize in, in offering that type of housing to seniors. Um, and you can also keep it in mind, if you have a duplex, a triplex, um, depending on how you're designing like a ground floor unit, depending on how accessible you're making it, you could be servicing uh, a market here. A lot of the time, and, and I'm guilty of this too, if I'm doing a renovation, I think, oh, you know, what's a young professional want, right? Okay, so I'm going to put in a smart thermostat, some cool cameras, um, some digital doohickeys and, and gadgets that are going to make them excited. Um, but this is a market that's going to be, that's booming uh, over the next couple of decades. So I just want to plant the seed for you to not ignore it. And I'm reminding myself not to ignore this demographic. So biggest takeaway, like I was saying, is, is really the imbalance in, in supply and demand. Um, <coughs> so it's, it's pretty simple. Um, uh, it, it, it seems likely that unlike uh, previous generations, uh, millennials, a large part of, the, of that generation, will be renting forever. Um, it's just a fact. doesn't make me happy, but it is what it is. Um, and for those of you who track uh, low vacancy rates, um, they are still, five years ago we were saying they're historically low. They're still historically low and even lower. Um, we're as close to 0% vacancy for residential rentals in the city of Toronto as, as is practically possible. Um, the only uh, significant blip of vacancies that I ever see is when a pre-construction or in a, a condo building is going up and, and the buyers have the right to there's a period of time, I don't want to get into the, 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 the explanation right now, but it's called interim occupancy where you don't own the unit yet, but you have the right to occupy it or lease it. And usually that interim occupancy is anywhere from 4 to 12 or even 18 months. So you, you, you're allowed to live in it or rent it out, uh, but you don't own it yet and you haven't paid a mortgage, uh, put a money, uh, the money down for the property yet. Um, during that period of time, there's often a glut of, of properties. Um, sorry, an, an oversupply of properties um, that comes on the market. So you'll see as a broker, you'll see an address 100 Simcoe Street. And in our daily news flashes, you see 20 or 30 or 50 new properties. Um, and because there's a lot of supply in a new building, it will take a few weeks, sometimes a few months for all that to be absorbed. But that's the majority of the real vacancy that I see. And some people have, have said to me in the past, well, but if there's so much demand, 50, even 100 units, becoming available overnight for rent in a building, those should get snapped up within the first week. Yes, the, the no part of the answer is, um, has anybody been in a building that's in interim occupancy? Sort of, some of you? It's not pretty sometimes. Yeah. Like literally, uh, the, the, the walls in the hallways are not, are not painted. Uh, there's no carpet on the floor, it's concrete. Um, the elevators are covered in, in cardboard protective wrap on the inside with just a cutout where you push the buttons. You're, you're living in a semi-construction zone. So I just want to offer that why it takes sometimes a few months for even 20 or 30 units to be absorbed by the market. Can you get a, a better deal? You can't. You, you, as, a, as a tenant, you yeah. can yeah. because uh, along with interim occupancy comes something called uh, what we call phantom rent. So you're paying the developer usually the equivalent of an average uh, property tax and mortgage payment per month. So if your mortgage payment and property taxes were going to be $3,000 a month once you close on the transaction, you're paying around that, $2,800, $3,100. Uh, there's a formula on how to calculate the phantom rent, but you are paying that. So if you're an investor 
and you're not intending to move into that unit, and all of a sudden you're paying three thousand dollars a month, then yes, there can be an incentive to say, "Oh, sure," you know, if 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 it becomes uh, something that's bothering you enough.